Szanowni Państwo, zaczynamy. We are going to start, so we are going to start the first discussion panel in the course of our conference. And well, immediately, let me just say that, uh, that this is going to be a discussion of panel that is going to be conducted in English. So should anyone is willing to use the interpretation service, so this is the time to collect the headsets. So could you please try to find the headsets, put them on, uh, and uh, in that way, you will be able to um, listen to the interpretation. And finally, the last comment. Uh, well, over there, you do have the channel, the first channel, uh, Polish language, and uh, English is on the so second channel. Uh, and uh, well, there's also uh, well another remark that I'm going to still make in Polish, namely that all the materials from this uh, conference are going to be published, uh, and uh, well, we are going to publish a booklet, if you will. Well, yes, yes, indeed. Well, you you can sort of write to us uh, should you uh, like to have a copy. So if the um, a speaker would not uh, uh, like to uh, write that down. We are going to have this transcript. Uh, uh, however, you can sort of uh, uh, also uh, right. let us know. So now I'll start speaking English, if you, if you don't mind. So um, it is a great honor and pleasure for me to be here among such illustrious uh, and famous guests and uh, be a moderator of the first panel here, discussion panel. As the uh, time schedule is very tight, we all realize that, I'll hold my horses, I will not talk too much, as I tend to talk too much, and i let the speakers speak, because that's, that's what they're here for. So, um, the idea of the discussion panel is that each of the speakers has a short presentation, short meaning 10, up to 15 minutes, and then there's a discussion among us. Uh, including audience, of course. Now, there's one exception in our panel, and, and the exception is because we have a guest of honor from Austria, and uh, Professor Holzinger, because that's, uh, that's who I'm talking about, will have a short lecture from over here, and uh, this, the topic of his lecture will be judicial independence and constitutional justice. Now, just a few words about uh, Professor Holzing Holzinger. He was a president of Austrian Commission of Jurists between 2000 and 2008. He was a president of the Austrian Society for the Management Sciences, a member of the board. Um, he was also president of the Law Society of Vienna and between 2011 and 2014, he was president of the Conference of European Constitutional Courts. Now, um, Professor Holzinger is also professor, of course, of the University of Graz, and since 1995 uh, has been a member of Constitutional Court, repeatedly elected permanent judge rapporteur, and since 1st of May 2008, he's the president of the Constitutional Court. It is a great pleasure to have you here, and Professor Holzinger, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank the National Council of the Judiciary of Poland and in particular its chairman f very cordially for inviting me to participate in this interesting international conference. Independence of the judiciary is the most important characteristic and the cornerstone of a system government governed uh, by the rule of law. This concept is uh, clearly reflected uh, by Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms as well as by Article 47 of the Charter of Human Rights of the European Union. In order to establish whether, whether a court can be considered independent, regard must be had, for instance, to the manner of appointment of its members and the term of office, the existence of guarantees against external pressures, coming from other state organs. 
in particular with a view of, uh, to the removal of judges. And also to the question whether the body presents an appearance of independ independence. Justice must not only be done, justice must, on, uh, must also to be seen to be done, says the European uh, Court for Human Rights. And all these criteria contribute to the confidence which courts in a democratically society must inspire in the public and above all in the parties to proceedings. And this all holds true especially, especially for constitutional justice and its specific tasks. The idea of constitutional justice, which we owe above all to the famous Austrian legal theorist Hans Kelsen, is essentially based firstly on the pre uh, preposition that all state action, including parliamentary legislation, must be based on the constitution and must be in accordance in accordance with the Constitution. With the Constitution as the highest ranking norm in a certain legal order. And secondly, therefore, constitutional disputes, namely disputes on the interpretation and the implementation of the Constitution are not only politically but also legal in nature and can therefore be decided by a special court, namely the constitutional court, based on the law rather than exclusively on political considerations. And in this sense, it is true that constitutional justice is the most important guardian of the constitution as Hans Kelsen put it in his works. Thus, a smoothly running system of constitutional justice is not only an essential component of a state under the rule of law, but also an important factor for the political stability of a state. It is no coincidence, ladies and gentlemen, that since World War II, constitutional courts were typically established in a quite number of European countries in the course of a transformation process from dictatorship to democracy. For instance, in the 1940s in Germany and in Italy, and later in Spain and in Portugal, after the decline of the di dictatorship regimes in these countries. And especially and finally, in a lot of Central and Eastern European countries in the late 1980s and in the first 1990s. And the purpose of setting up these courts was obviously to overcome, to overcome the legacy of the previous regimes and to protect human rights violated by, this re by these regimes. Instead of the principle of the unity, unity of power, which had been characteristic especially for the former socialist states, the system of the separation of powers was introduced. And this new system was based on the principle of checks and balances between the different state organs. And as a consequence, even parliament has to respect the supremacy of the constitution and can thus be controlled by a constitutional court. Constitutional justice is therefore, as I mentioned already, a key component of checks and balances in a constitutional democracy. It is a catalyst in a democratic society 
committed to the protection of human rights and the rule of law. The rule of law, which is according to a well-known legal, Swiss legal theorist, Werner Kegi, an order in which a politically mature people, a politically mature nation, recognizes its own limits. Therefore, it would be a misconception to see that this review function of constitutional justice as being in contradiction to democracy. On the contrary, the judicial review to implement the, uh, the judicial review of norms by the Constitutional Court actually serves as a vehicle to implement the democratic principle. As Hans Kelsen pointed out, even a democratic majority rule would only be bearable if it were exercised lawfully, and that means above all in conformity with the constitution of a certain state. And accordingly, constitutional justice exercises also a democratic function whenever it reviews parliament's compliance with the constitution. The functions given to the constitutional court, in particular its jurisdiction to review the constitutionality of laws, highlight its political significance. Given its specific mandate, the Constitutional Court finds itself at the borderline between law and politics. On the one hand, the Constitutional Court is a genuine court in the strict constitutional sense that means an autonomous state body which is independent of parliament and government. Its judgment are based solely on the law, notably on the Constitution, as the highest ranking norm in a certain legal order. On the other hand, however, the judgments delivered by the Constitutional Court almost inevitably have sometimes considerable political impact. This is true in particular when it comes to its jurisdiction to review the constitutionality of law. That means acts of the democratically legitimized legislator. In this respect, the Constitutional Court finds itself sometimes opposed to parliament and government. And the political parties which form a government as well as the parliamentary majority. If the Constitutional Court finds a legal provision to be in contradiction with the Constitution, it must repeal it as being unconstitutional, even if this may appear politic to be politically inexpedient. This may, of course, give rise to tensions with other state organs. However, even when dealing with politically charged issues, a constitutional court must never lose sight of its mission to guarantee the primacy of the Constitution. All this goes to show that the legitimacy of constitutional justice and its effectiveness depend essentially on its independence. Only its independence will allow a constitutional court to gain public confidence. Public confidence, which is essentially for its work. It is the most valuable asset of a constitutional court to be sure of the confidence of the people living in a country in the correct and unaffected way of accomplishment of its tasks, unswayable by external factors. Another significant aspect of the independence of the judiciary is that judges cannot be removed from office but by reason of a decision of the court itself. This principle is too valuable to be sacrificed 
to political considerations. In particular, if the principle of irremovability of judges were put aside, this could easily undermine public confidence in the judiciary as a whole, and in this way cause irreversible damage to the rule of law. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like uh, to finish my address by expressing how pleased I am about the good relations between the Constitutional Tribunal of Poland and the Constitutional Court of Austria. Good relations which, which stretch back to the early 1990s. It's precisely because these relations are very good, however, that the Austrian Constitutional Court, its president and its members are seriously concerned about recent developments in constitutional justice in Poland. It would be extremely deplorable if as a result of these developments, constitutional justice in this country were weakened in a lasting manner. In its 30 years, in its three decades of, decades of existence, the Constitutional Tribunal of Poland has acquired towering merits by safeguarding democracy and the rule of law, as well as by, the, by effectively protecting human rights in Poland. Thanks to this remarkable success, the Constitutional Tribunal and all its members have become a highly respected member of the European and the international community of constitutional justice, as well as an influential model, influential model for constitutional justice here in Europe and worldwide. It is, it is not for me to comment on the political situation in Poland, However, as a member of the Constitutional Court of a member state of the European Union and as a member of uh, the Constitutional Court, which is the oldest one in the world, I would like to add the following remark. Constitutional justice is a key element of the European rule of law system. If this significant achievement were damaged just in Poland, this would cause a normal loss hitting all of us, all of us who feel committed to democracy and rule of law. Therefore, I do hope that the current crisis of constitutional justice in Poland will be overcome. I would be very glad if my words and my participation in this uh, in this conference, which may be seen only as a sign of solidarity with the judiciary in your country, in particular with my colleagues from the Constitutional Tribunal of Poland, if all this may a little bit contribute to a positive and a good end of this process. I wish all of you, dear, colleagues the very best for a successful conference in each of every respect and thank you very much for your invitation and for your attention to my words. Thank you very much. Thank you very much Professor Holzinger for your kind words. I think that uh, there were so many topics in your presentation that some of them might serve as a, as a topic for a separate conference. For example, the idea of uh, public conf confidence inspired by judiciary is especially important. And Han Hans Kelsen's legacy is also such, such a broad topic. Thank you very much. And uh, now we will continue with, uh, with the work of our discussion uh, panel. Uh, the next speaker will be Sir Jeffrey Voss, who, uh, as uh, President Zawistowski has already mentioned, uh, is the President of the European Network of Councils of Judiciary, ENCJ, and a British Judge of the Court of Appeal of England and Wales. 
Um, at first, as it is quite common with British judges, Sir Geoffrey Voss was called to the bar at the Inner Temple. Uh, then he was a chairman of the Bar Council and uh, then was appointed as a judge of the Court of Appeal of England and Wales. Now, we will also have the pleasure to host him again in June here in Warsaw, because this year uh, the General Assembly of ENCJ, of the European Network of Councils of Judiciary, will take place in Warsaw in this very same building. So, Jeffrey Voss, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Greg, uh, very much for that introduction. Um, I have to reduce the level of the microphone, otherwise it'll be above my head. I hope that you can see me above the platform here. Um, actually, this is uh, not the first time I've been to Warsaw, uh, although I shall be here twice this year, as Greg has pointed out. I was last here in 1970, uh, which uh, I found to be a rather different experience from uh, arriving yesterday. Uh, but I'm very pleased to be back and uh, very pleased that I shall be returning again in June. First of all, I want to make it clear that nothing I say should be interpreted as any comment, even colorably, of a political nature on what is going on here in Warsaw at the moment. I echo what Professor Holzinger said, that it is not for us international commentators to uh, comment on your own domestic political issues. Uh, what I want to do is to stick to first principles and try and stick also to the theme of the conference, which is the limits of judicial independence. And as many of you may know, the ENCJ, of which I am its current president, has made a long-term study of the independence and accountability of the judiciary. We're in a third year, the third year of that project. And therefore, I don't think I would be criticized for saying that some of the work that the ENCJ has undertaken in this field is of a groundbreaking nature. Uh, for example, we've been undertaking a survey of 6,000 European judges as to their own views of their independence. And we published the results last summer. And I think that uh, Mr. Wigo Larsen from Norway will be saying a little bit more about that uh, later this morning. The results are truly astonishing and they repay study. So against this background, I feel reasonably well qualified to comment on the subject of our debate. The first point to make is that judges must be independent for one simple reason. Sometimes one loses sight of the reason. It's because they have to decide cases between the citizen and the state. And if they are deciding cases between the citizen and the state, which most cases really are, they have to be independent of the state in order to do so and to achieve the confidence of the public that they serve. Uh, but I'm not sure that this means, as some judges certainly think it does, that there is and can be no limits to judicial independence. Judges are, as everybody has said this morning, one of the three pillars of state. And rather like the rule of law itself, judicial independence is not an absolute it is more of an aspiration. Judges can and should be functionally and practically free from influence from the executive and from the legislature, but they cannot operate in a constitutional vacuum. That is, I think, obvious. Politicians obvious, often add to the words that I've just spoken in their decision-making. So politicians will say, Judges can and should be functionally and practically free from influence from the executive and the legislature in their decision making. This qualification is explained by saying that it's not practicable for judges to be free 
from the peripheral influence of government, from decision making, when in reality the courts have to be financed by the government and judicial leadership must in practice cooperate with government if the justice system is to operate within other state structures to deliver efficient, high quality justice for the benefit of those, all those, who need to have their disputes resolved by the courts. In my view, however, this qualification, the words in their decision making, is a potentially dangerous one, at least if it is taken as meaning that governments can do whatever they want in relation to judges and the justice system so long as they don't interfere with any individual decision. Of course, many, many government decisions can affect individual decisions indirectly. To take a well-known example, judges in the Supreme Court of the United States are appointed by a political process. If just one of the right-leaning justices is replaced by a left-leaning justice, it's a matter of historical fact that decisions on highly charged legal issues arising under the Constitution, like, for example, abortion or segregation, will be fundamentally affected. Likewise, in 2012, when the US Supreme Court upheld the controversial medical care reforms promulgated by President Obama under the federal government's authority to implement and enforce taxes, the US Supreme Court Justice Roberts said, and I quote, members of this court are vested with the authority to interpret the law. We possess neither the expertise nor the prerogative to make policy judgments. Those decisions are entrusted to our nation's elected leaders who can be thrown out of office if the people disagree with them. It's not our job to protect the people from the consequences of their political choices. I close the quote. This has been paraphrased as his speech on elections have consequences. But where then does the balance of principle lie? As a matter of principle, when is it appropriate for judges to complain that their independence is being interfered with as a result of reforms introduced by an elected government? These are amongst the most difficult questions of our age, but I believe they can be answered by reference to the well-known and well-established principles promulgated by the ENCJ. Three of these principles can be shortly summarized as follows. First, every citizen in a democratic society is entitled to benefit from an independent, self-governing judiciary, which must be and must be seen to be independent of both the, both the legislative and executive branches of government and should be recognized by politicians, citizens, and judges. Secondly, judges and the Council for the Judiciary should be closely involved in the formation and implementation of all plans for the reform of the judiciary and the judicial system. That is a particularly important principle. And thirdly, judges should be appointed, all judges should be appointed, on the basis of merit and capability alone. Now, these principles set the limits of judicial independence. First, judges and councils must be closely involved in the reforms to the judicial system. Reforms should not be done to them, but equally they cannot stand out against the will of a freely elected democratic government, as Justice Roberts reminded us. The involvement of civil society representatives in the appointment of judges is one thing that can help reduce the deficit in what some regard as their democratic legitimacy. This is something that the ENCJ is studying as one of its projects this year. The principles I've mentioned also demonstrate that judges should never be appointed for political reasons. They should be appointed because and only because of their ability to take impartial decisions on the basis of the law and the evidence without fear or favor. 
In some situations, judges can be perceived as hostile to modernization and reform of the justice system. Now, this too should not be the case, provided always that the contemplated reforms are aimed at improving the quality of the justice system for the benefit of those it serves. Judicial involvement in the reform process should provide the balance between the wishes of the elected government and the need to maintain judicial impartiality and the rule of law. Throughout Europe, these are challenging times for all our justice systems. In most countries, the justice system has had to face reducing budgets, increasing workload for all the judges. Judges cannot stand apart from the economic realities that everyone else in their countries face, but they can and should and must insist on a meaningful voice in how the limited resources are deployed so as best to safeguard a high quality justice system for the citizen. It's perhaps appropriate to drill down just a little bit further into the precise terms of acceptable limitations on judicial independence. I can see no justification for any limits on the need for a wholly independent judicial appointment process nor for any limitation on the absolute necessity for the decisions taken by individual judges and individual courts to be inviolable. They must be free from all inappropriate external influences from politicians, from the media, from other pressure groups. The telephone justice prevalent in some parts of the old Soviet bloc is universally regarded rightly with derision. It is here, however, that the gray area comes into view. Some judges regard it as an infringement of their independence to be told by their court presidents, for example, to deal with their cases more quickly or to increase their workload. I can't agree with that approach. The reason is because judges cannot be independent unless they are also accountable. Accountability is the quid pro quo for independence. And judges cannot simply say that they are the final arbiters of what they do and how they do it. They need to be seen to be cooperating in the operation of an efficient legal and justice system. Part of that cooperation is, as I've said, with the other branches of government who will have been elected to ensure that the justice system functions properly. Judges are, however, entitled to functional independence. They should not, for example, example, be deprived of the tools they need to do their work. Any functioning system needs physical premises, information technology, staff, etc. But that doesn't mean that judges are entitled to better facilities than anyone else in the public service. But it does mean that the third arm of state must be provided with adequate and proper facilities and resources. I can perhaps interpose a cautionary tale from uh, the United Kingdom. We there are in the process of undergoing a major reform of the court service, which operates and manages the courts and the deployment of judges. Uh, this will result in less physical courts, more online courts, more modern information technology, less staff overall, and maybe even less judges. I hope I won't be a casualty of the reform, uh, but it's being undertaken uh, with the cooperation of the judges. Such a reform offers the potential to interfere with the independence of the judiciary, but change does not automatically do so. The key to all such processes is, I think, meaningful involvement of the judges and the counsel for the judiciary in the entire process. So can I then attempt to pull the threads of what I've been saying together? The executive in all countries needs to have a clear understanding of what judicial independence and accountability entails. That is why the work of the ENCJ in this area is so important. And I urge any of you with a real interest in the subject to look at our two reports on the subject from 2014 and 2015. Judges also need the same understanding they need to realize that the concept of judicial independence is not, as I said earlier, an absolute concept. Judges are responsible 
for the efficient delivery of justice. And that is a grave responsibility. To achieve it, they must work with their governments to understand the necessary barriers, barriers, buffers between the pillars of state. But first and foremost, to provide what is imperative in every state, a fair and impartial decision-making process in which citizens from all parts of our societies and the state itself can have absolute confidence. This will only happen where there is a healthy measure of respect between the judiciary on the one hand and the executive and the legislature on the other. I am sure that the debate after the speeches of us uh, few visitors will descend to the particularity of the issues uh, that are currently under consideration here in Poland. For my part, however, I would suggest that almost every issue can be resolved by a consideration of the applicable underlying principles. And it's those principles on which I've tried to place emphasis this morning. As the president of the Bar Council said uh, some moments ago, I am not afraid for the future of Poland if you judges go for it. I think that was a wonderful injunction which should be taken as the motto for this conference. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. I must say that, uh, again, there are many topics uh, mentioned by you. One is especially interesting, and I think it needs deeper, in-depth studies here in Poland, which is the administrative supervision versus the accountability of a judge. That's a very important issue. Now, as you have rightly defined uh, the judicial independence, it, it, it's in English, it covers two aspects. If you look at the uh, title of the conference in Polish, it's much longer than in English because the English, it's just judicial independence. Now, what, what I wanted to explain to our foreign guests is that it covers both independence of judiciary as such against other state powers and the internal independence of a judge. But I guess you guessed it rightly. So, uh, we continue... Uh, with our next next speaker, Dr. Orlando Afonso from Portugal, Judge Counselor uh, of the Supreme Court of Justice of Portugal. Um, he was a member of the Supreme Judicial Council uh, between 1992 and 1995. Um, then he was a president of the European Medel, Medel Magistrates Association and also, Dr. Afonso was president of the Consultative Council of European Judges, CCJE. So, as you can hear, uh, we have a great expert here, very active on the international field. So, now, Dr. Afonso, the floor is yours. Thank you. I think like the lawyers, I have the privilege to uh, speak sitting. Um, in first place, I want to thank to the Council, the High Council of Poland, this invitation. It's not for me the first time I be in Poland I know well, of course, what it can be well. Uh, I work with the other times with some Polish colleagues here in Poland and some Polish colleagues in Portugal. And uh, we have uh, a mutual experience uh, in the both Councils uh, in the High Council, Portuguese High Council, and the High Council of Poland. I, I want to only uh, have with you some few reflections about the independence. Uh, I, I, I begin 
with the sentence. Today, this sentence is very, very expanded in all countries, but it's a sentence of uh, pronounced in um, 1834 by the president of Supreme Court, Portuguese Supreme Court, in a letter addressed to our queen in this times, Maria II. He wrote, the queen wants to abolish the irremovability of the judges. And the president of the Supreme Court with all counselors of the Supreme Court in those times it, they are 11, now they are 60, but in those times they are 11, they address a letter to the queen saying, Mom, the independence of the judges are not a privilege of the judges, but a guarantee of the society. You know, that begins well, but the end it's not well. The queen dismissed the president of the Supreme Court. It's with this idea of guarantee, we can talk about independence. Of course, independence is written in every constitution, normally today, nowadays. In European Union, the independence is written in every constitution. But is enough to be written in every constitution? What independence is? In first place, independence is a guarantee. It's a political guarantee. Guarantee of what? Guarantee of the impartiality of the judges. The objective impartiality, like the objective impartiality, is a guarantee of the subjective impartiality of the judges. Then we have a chain of guarantees. Impart subjective impartiality, the judge must, when he is sitting, must don't have any thing we do with the case. Subjectively, he cannot be love or be hate the persons who are in the case. Then, he must be impartial. He must be fair. Of course, uh, I'm not fair because I am judge. But I am judge to be fair. And to be fair, I must be impartial. And to be impartial, I must be independent. Independence of what? Independence, of course, of the other powers of the state. But not only, but not only. Independence, external independence, of course, independence of the other powers of the state, independence of the powers not legitimated, existent inside the state, the all powers, independence, internal independence, independence of the hierarchy independence of the powers inside the judicial system. This is the, the problem of the independence. There are limits to the independence, of course there are. We arrive there. The idea of the independence, the source of the independence, is the same of the legitimacy. In the CCG, we have uh, 
three opinions important in these matters. The first opinion, the independence of the judiciary. The, this other opinion needs the opinion number, Number three, the ethics and liability of judges. And this last opinion about the legitimacy and the relationships, the 18 opinion, legitimacy and the relationships between the judicial power and the other powers of the state. Of course, I said the independence uh, and the legitimacy of the judicial power have the same sources, uh, the same roots. Uh, when we talk about legitimacy, of course, the first why the judicial power is a legitimate power, because the Constitution said, because the uh, the constitution in each country said there exists a judicial power separate of the other powers and the constitution said how is the servants of this judicial power. Well, that is the first approach of the legitimacy. But there are another. It's the same of the independence. It's the job of the judge. What the judge do? What is his task? The truth. The knowledge of the truth. I don't decide because I want to decide of this way. <laughs> I don't decide because I have the power to decide of this way. I decide because I have the knowledge what the truth, of course it's not the absolute truth, what the truth is in each case. I must say what is the truth and what is the false. I must say what is the right and what is the wrong. What is the right and what is the tort. What is the law, what is against the law? That is the origin of my independence, of my legitimacy. My legitimacy, it's not depend of any majority. Any majority. Everybody can be against one person. And I can be the unique. I am not against anybody. I must find what the truth of the facts and what the truth of the law is. Well, this one point of reflection. The other point of reflection, and I don't want to much time. Uh, it's, uh, I talk about the guarantees. Of course, the, guarantee, the independence is a guarantee. But to exist independence, we must have other guarantees. One is the separation of powers, of course, is one guarantee of independence. The other is the self-governing of the judiciary. The self-governing of the judiciary is a guarantee of the independence. The High Council must be a guarantee. If the High Council is not a guarantee of the independence, we don't need them. We need the High Council because he has the guarantee of the independence of the judges. That is the point. Of course, uh, we can say, but uh, the judges, what is the reverse of this independence? Someone talks about responsibility. 
The responsibility, it's a word, a very confused word. Because the responsibility, this word in English, a responsibility in French, they come from the same verb in Latin. Respondere, responsum in Latin. In Latin, responsum, respondere, don't mean to give explanations to someone. It means have the confidence, someone we can trust. The judge is responsible because we can trust on him. We can trust why? We can trust because his ethics, because uh, his competence, because uh, his uh, way to see the problems and the case must our trust. That we can call responsible. And this responsibility have two faces. One, our, my colleague, English colleague talks, the accountability. What accountability is? I say you the, 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 the conclusion, the conclusion number eight, say uh, of the, the, the CCG, these, these opinions say, judges are made accountable by working in the transparent fashion, by having open hearings and by giving reasoned judgments, engaging with the public and the other powers of the state. Judges render an account of their actions to them. What that means? That means the judge we can, oh, can offer confidence, trust to the rest of the citizens. This is one thing. The other thing different of this it's liability. The liability, if the judge cannot be accountable and his behavior is not appropriate, of course, there is a limit of his independence. Independence don't mean energy. That is the liability of the judge. In practice, of course, I, I talk about this, but in practice, what that means in practice? That means independence in the appointment, independence in the training, independence in the promotion, independence in the be not irremovable, independence in his or their decisions, of course, the independence of their decisions. They are dependent also of the independence of the public prosecutors, of the independence of the lawyers, of the in some independence of the civil servants. I cannot have an independent decision if the case is not dependent. Independent then independence of the decisions, independence of the enforcement of the decisions. I can give a good decision, but they are not enforced. It. Then what independence is that? No. That is some topics I want to share, share with you. Of course, you can agree or not with me, but uh, uh, it's my reflection. Uh, on these topics and the rest we can talk each other. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, 
I don't know whether the judges of the European Court of Human Rights uh, read letters to the Queen, but basically it's the same, exactly the same wording used in many verdicts, many judgments of the European Court of Human Rights. It's not a privilege, it's the guarantee, exactly. And, uh, and just, uh, just a technical remark that uh, the first 10 opinions of CCJE were put together in Magna Carta, Magna Carta of judges, and exactly the, the, the big principles, and uh, Judge Afonso has participated in, in working on this uh, document. So, <clears throat> we will continue with our next speaker from Lithuania, uh, Professor Vigintas Vyshinskis. Uh, Professor Vyshinskis uh, is, a, is a judge of the uh, Court of Appeals of Lithuania, also member of Judicial Council of Lithuania, professor of Mykolas Romeris University in Vilnius, and uh, he has visited Poland uh, many times and has a deep knowledge about Poland and our legal system. Judge Vyshinskis, the floor is yours. Thank you for inviting me uh, to this to this conference. It's a great honor for me to be here. Pan Barkowski asked me uh, to introduce uh, for Polish colleagues about the uh, situation with uh, judicial independence in Lithuania. I could say that, uh, that understanding democracy, judicial independence in Poland and in Lithuania is in general the same, very similar. Relations between public authorities play a very important role in a democratic society. Many of us we remember the past when the communist regime concentrated leg legislative, executive, and judicial functions. The, dis the di division of separation of powers and is recognized and applied in all democratic states. The independence of the judicial system in Lithuania and relations with other powers is based on three legal pillars. It's constitution, constitutional court, doctri court doctrine, and laws. About constitution, I don't want to speak about constitution because regulation in majority countries is very, very similar. And regulation in Lithuania, constitutional regulation, independence of judiciary in Lithuania and in Poland, it's similar. About statutory regulation, I don't want to speak about it too, because because uh, I think it's very similar in Lithuania in, and in in Poland too, because we have court law, court, courts law law and courts, and also we have criminal code who, uh, who, who, who provides the criminal liability against, against, against uh, people who are going under judicial independence. I would like to introduce you with constitutional court doctrine. The most significant formulated doctrine by constitutional court is the independence of the judiciary. It must be recognized that the Constitution Court is very influential and respected in Lithuania and has great public support. The respect and authority was deserved by the decision of the Constitutional Court that they have made very principled, sometimes very unpopular decisions. In recent years, the Constitutional Court addressed very much dispute issues. What is a family concept and, relates and related question to same-sex marriages? I think it's very important for, Poland, uh, for Polish uh, people too. The right to government to reduce salaries and pensions and the obligation to restore them and etc. Other powers, with the exception of the judicial authorities, sometimes discuss negatively decisions of the Constitutional Court but in general, they execute these decisions. But there are some exceptions. Currently, there are 12 legal acts 
that are recognized by, constitutional, by the Constitutional Court as un unconstitutional, but they are not changed. Next week will be 10 years when provisioned on one law, law on the petition, petitions have been recognized as un anti-constitutional. It was in 26th of January year 2006, but these provisions still remain in the law, in that law. Constitutional doctrine very significantly influence and reinforce the independence of the judicial system. Its importance is that adopted laws by the parliament or adopted resolution by the government can be changed in any time. Constitutional court interprets the constitution. The process to modify the constitution in Lithuania is very, very complicated and same as even do not try to do so. Then constitutional court just recognize that laws contradict to the constitution, such laws are not valid immediately. The newly, adopt, the newly adopted laws meet the instruction and requirements from the constitutional court in, in accordance with the constitution. I <coughs> would like to suggest so, to a fear, few thesis from the Constitutional Court resolutions concerning the relationship between other powers and judicial authorities. In the Constitution prohibits the executive branch to interfere in the administration of the justice, to influence court, or, the, or evaluate the work of court's judicial pr pr proceedings especially to indicate how justice should be carried out. The same, the same statement was enacted in your constitutional court. Polish Constitutional Tribunal decided, it, I, am, I am meaning about the decision which was made in uh, 9th of uh, November 1993, that the principle of the independence of judiciary should reflect both the or organization, organizational division and competencies, and the freedom from any interface by the executive and legislative branches in judicial functions. The administration of justice in the courts, the activity must not feel any interfer interference by the executive branch, but for the administration, provisions could be made by the Minister of Justice. Could be made by the Minister of Justice. It's written in your constitutional tribunal decision. In Lithuania, the Constitutional Court had different position about participation in the Minister of Justice. We already discussed about, with Luk uh, with, about it with Lukas in, in, in Spain. The law on courts, which was adopted previously, granted both powers for the Ministry of Justice. Constitutional Court decided that it's con contradicted to the Constitution. The Constitutional Court decided that provisions that were in the law of courts enacted in 1999 are unconstitutional, and it is a valuation of judiciary and independence of judiciary where, num where the number of county judges and number of judges in the Court of Appeal, Criminal and Civil Divisions, were decided by the Minister of Justice. Constitutional Court decided that the provisions when the Minister of Justice appointed judge to the judge's Court of Honor, when the Minister of Justice is able to start for the judge disciplinary proceedings, when the Minister of Justice was in charge to organize the financial support for courts, then the Minister of Justice monitors the courts and judges' administrative activities are unconstitutional. And the main issue, today, Minister of Justice in Lithuania has a single task in connection with courts. He approves the annual plans for training of judges, only in this field. You could ask me who is administrating, administra administrating the courts, who ensures their independence if they are not under anyone's, anyone's governments. Answer could be judiciary self-governments. Part first, Article 
186 of the Constitution of the Republic of Poland states that National Judiciary Council shall ensure the independence of courts and judges. There is the, no such specific provision in Lithuanian Constitution, but uh, very similar interpretation from the Constitutional Court. And some words about uh, Constitutional uh, judicial, con judicial Council. Judicial Council in Lithuania, like in Poland, is the executive arm of the self-governance self-governance body, which influences the independence of court and judges. According, in the inter uh, according to the interpretation of the Constitutional Court, the National Court Administration was established as an institution funded by state, budget, and support self-governance of courts. About composition of Judicial Council, according decision of the Constitutional Court, members of the Judicial Council can be judges only. Some words about funding. Funding is a very important question in the same everywhere and for everyone. And also we have clarification from the side of the Constitutional Court. Constitutional Court said, Minister of Justice is not the manager of court's appro appro appropriations so he cannot decide how each court should use the state budget funds allocated for to their functions. About relationship, uh, about relationship with Parliament, with SEMAS. In Lithuania, we have a rule that all new law projects must be presented to the relevant institution for their opinion before being considered by the Parliament. All new laws projects in, con uh, in connection to the courts are presented to the Judicial Council, which gives its opinion. Sometimes, not sometimes, usually, Council presenters are even invited to the Parliament to present and explain their views. And uh, I cannot remember a single, a single case when judge council, judge's council's opinion has not been taken into consideration by the Parliament. But now, but now, this problem is coming, is coming, and it will be, it could be conflict between judiciary, Parliament, and Parliament and Government, because the uh, problem is regulation about uh, judiciary pension systems. Public opinion about judiciary, judiciary pensions, uh, pensions system is very negative, and uh, our Constitutional Court protected, pro protected our uh, social guarantees, judges social guarantees, as part of judges' independence. It will be problem in f nearest future. About, about, about other governmental powers today who have the most impact. Appointment of judges and the career according to the Constitution is under the power of the President. The appointment of judges to the Supreme Court and Court of Appeal is under the same as. Any constitutional appointment, transfer or exemption may be granted only with the approval from the Judicial Council, but the right of initiative belongs only on the President. The power of the Judicial Council is to waste it only in disapproval, its uh, veto power, which is very, very limited. On one hand, on one hand, it's problem because Judicial Council don't have really influence for judges' selection and promotion. But, but Judicial Council is rep responsible for the, for the judiciary in general. Last year, several candidates for the Supreme Court Justice have not, be have not been approved by the SEMAS by secret vote, and no one knows why. On the other hand, the judges' dismiss dismissal or transfer is not possible without approval the, from the Judicial Council. <sighs> Independence of the judiciary is privilege, not for judiciary, it's privilege for society. And in judicial independence is part of democracy and they could exist only together only together. 
I hope democracy, democratic approach will be dominated between all state powers in Poland in future and in Lithuania. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Wyszynski, uh, for your presentation and uh, presenting the Lithuanian experience, which is sometimes similar to the Polish ones, indeed. Um, we continue with our next speaker, uh, Judge Nicolae Horatius Dumbrava from Romania. He's a member of the Supreme Council of Magistracy of Romania. Uh, between 2011 and 2012, Judge Dumbrava was a chairman of the Supreme Council of Judiciary. Uh, he's also the president of the Court of Appeal in Targu Mures. Is that correct? Yeah and uh, was a founding member of the National Union of Judges of Romania. We will hear about the Romanian experience in the relations between judiciary and other state powers. The yeah. floor is yours. Mr. Chairman, uh, dear colleagues, uh, I, I think we are in, in the pause now. I have five minutes, Greg, or 10 minutes. I tried to contrast, uh, concentrate in a couple of minutes. Uh, I've heard it very attentive, the previous discourses. Uh, it, raised, it raised for me a question for all people here. How many politicians are here at this conference? I asked politely them to raise their hands. Not, not my hand. Yeah, uh, no one. Yeah, you're right. Uh, Mrs. Letovska, you, you need to cooperate with the other powers, but with which bodies? With who? With the empty chairs? It's not the case. This is why I think it fits this motto. You are humiliated when someone else decides for you upon a matter on which you ought and could decide for yourself. Romanian experience. The operation of the rule of law cannot be considered outside of a real independence of justice. The interdependence, the mutual connection of the two concepts it is also acknowledged by international documents of certain bodies analyzing this issue. The first opinion of CCPG. Judicial independence is a prerequisite to the rule of law and the fundamental guarantee of a fair trial. Their independence, the independence of judges, of course, is not a prerogative or privilege on their own interests, but in the, in the, in the interests of the rule of law and of those seeking and expecting justice. I'm not a political scientist or sociologist, but just a judge. Thus, against this backdrop, I do not have the necessary tools to make a thorough analy analysis of the way through which the political power, using apparently democratic means, confiscate the rule of law, including justice, mainly in the Eastern Europe, Eastern Europe, a part of the European Union. But I cannot notice, not as a judge, but as, as a simpler citizen of the United Europe, how in this area, Romania, Slovakia, Hungary, Bulgaria, I don't know, probably Poland. There are similarities on dominating and taking over the rule of law by the political power. There are also specific differences uh, for each country according to the local history and to the methods used by the elites in the political, intellectual, and justice areas to observe the democratic values. Complicities between the representatives of those elites, including justice, existed and for sure will exist. Complicities based on personal or group interests that allowed in numerous cases to have successful actions of political power. But also firm oppositions existed. Clear actions that prevented the confiscation of the rule of law by the political power. We can talk endlessly on what is the rule of law, on the independence of justice, about the way the independence of justice ensures the functioning of the rule of law, and about how the rule of law enshrines the necessity for the independence of justice. But those principles 
must be brought outside the insulated classrooms of uh, university lecture. The kernel of those principles regards not only the definition and conceptual delimitation, but the effective enforcement into the real life. It is not my intention to enumerate international and, uh, and European documents, but to underline the importance of definitions and the limitations and of their application in the real life, at least for Romanian experience. Year 2012 was marked by important events in Romania. An important power of the Constitutional Court was amended by the government through an emergency ordinance. Keep in mind, not the parliament, but the government. This power related to checking the constitutionality of the decisions passed by the parliament. The constitutional court also marked an important moment. It passed a decision on the unconstitutionality of the emergency ordinance adopted by the government and thus the above mentioned power of the constitutional court remained unchanged. In the same year, 2012, a majority of the parliament decides on the temporary impeachment of the Romanian president. A referendum for the removal of the president takes place, but this ballot does not validate the request of the majority from the parliament and the president is back into office. Actually, the commencement of the events and the following political battle of 2012 were driven by the will to dominate the rule of law. The balance in certain moments was pushed by the persons who had more leverages of political powers, a majority in the parliament of within the government. In order to achieve the mentioned goal, the agenda of the political power during 2011-2014, when the political power was taken by several political forces, which seemed to be in apparent conflict, aimed at the amendment of the constitution. In 2011, the project of amendment belonged to the former president of Romania, which was suspended in 2012 by the majority of parliament, and in 2014, it was put forward by the majority of parliament, the one that impeached, impeached the president in 2012. Justice was among the important amendments taken into account by both political forces, and those changes also regarded the functioning and components of the Superior Council of Magistracy, which is the guarantor of the independence of justice according to the Romanian constitution in force. Both projects failed the test of constitutionality in 2011 and in 2014. It is also significant the description made the track record of the process on amending the Romanian constitution as it was pictured by the European Commission in the report drafted for the mechanism of cooperation and verification. The, co the cooperation verification uh, mechanism was set up at the accession uh, of Romania to the European Union in 2007. Uh, this uh, document uh, was published in, uh, in, uh, on uh, 28 uh, January 2015. The process of revision of the Constitution, said the European Commission, is relevant for the CVM as some amendments touch on justice and the functioning of the Superior Council of Magistracy. The stop-start process so far has been criticized for lacking in transparency, both in the time frame and the consultation process. The involvement of the Venice Commission has, however, helped to focus the process and the full participation of key institutions like the Superior Council of Magistracy will help to give confidence that any amendments will give full regard to the independence of the judiciary. During all this term, 2011, 2015, the justice took over the role of cleaning the Romanian society by intensifying the fight against corruption. The targets of this fight were politicians, but also judges and prosecutors. Furthermore, the number of disciplinary sanctions enforced by Superior Council of Magistracy increased. An, an even clearer picture of this phenomenon for the mentioned period is given by the statistics on judges and prosecutors. 98 judges on, and prosecutors were sanctioned 
for disciplinary offenses by Superior Council of Magistracy. It must be mentioned that CSM has competencies for guaranteeing the independence both judges and prosecutors. All those sanctions remain final after appeals lodged to the High Court of Cassation and Justice. Over 60 judges and prosecutors, some of them having management positions, were convicted to penalties with imprisonment for corruption. But the judiciary undertook the cleaning process within the justice system, even during the difficult conditions when the political power in intended to subordinate the justice to its own interests, the justice succeeded to bring in front of the judges from 2011 to 2015 many high level officials and an important part of those were subsequently convicted to harsh prison penalties. 11 senators and deputies, five acting ministers and former ministers, a former prime minister, we, uh, the prosecutors indicted a former prime minister in uh, exercise uh, in 2000, 2015, a member of European Parliament, more than 35 mayors and presidents of county councils. In those circumstances, it is obvious that the attacks against justice rose in an exponential manner, especially from the political domain. The political power had and still has a mass media exposure for its own news. In many cases, the politicians are also the owners of media companies so that the justice was attacked through proxies, the journalists, but also directly and was the subject of raging negative press campaigns. Statistics are again relevant. If in 2014, Superior Council of Magistracy noticed 12 such violations, in 2015, it noticed 28. A direct consequence is the, the increase of the confidence of Romanian citizens into, into justice from around 20% in 2011 to 44% in, in 2014. It is difficult to estimate the evolution on short and medium term and how justice will succeed to preserve its independence in Romania. A series of events will surely affect this development. Local elections, city halls and county councils. In the summer of 2016, and parliamentary elections in autumn of 2016. From the experience of past years, it comes out that justice was the main theme for electoral campaigns. Some politicians focused their attacks on the alleged abuses of justice and other, tried to defend justice in order to gain more votes. Another event, appointment of the president of High Court of Cassation and Justice and of a vice president of the High Court. Compare, uh, the, the nomination uh, will be made by the section of judges from the Superior Council of Magistracy and uh, this person will be no, uh, will nominated by the president of Romania. Another event very important, appointment into high, highest offices of the judiciary, the prosecutor general of general prosecutor's office and its deputy, two positions, adjuncts, two adjuncts, the chief prosecutor of national anti-corruption directorate. In this situation, the executive has an essential role because it proposed to the minister of justice the candidates for those, pos those positions. Superior Council of Magistracy only gives his consultative opinion. Finally, it seems that Romania is not an exception from the ge geographic area where it is located. Still, there is a particularity that must be highlighted through the cooperation and verification mechanism a condition accepted by Romania in order to accede to the European Union is sub subject to a monitoring jointly carried out with the European Commission. Pursuant to this instrument, the imminent side slips were stopped and it may be considered with minor ex exceptions that Romania stood on a fair road as regards the preservation of the rule of law and guaranteeing the independence of justice. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much, Judge Dumbrava, for sharing with us uh, the Romanian experience. Uh, very interesting in, indeed. And uh, we proceed with our last speaker, last but not least, uh, Uyghur Larsen from Norway, uh, who primarily worked as a lawyer, just like it happens in uh, Great Britain. In, in Scandinavian countries, it's quite similar. But afterwards, he joined the judiciary and currently serves as a judge of Gulating Court of Appeal in Bergen. And um, Judge Larsen was a member of and chairman of the Judicial Support Fund, as well as a chairman of the board of Maritime Museum Fund in Bergen. Uh, he worked uh, with ENCJ for many years and since March 2014 has been a vice chairman of the Norwegian Association of Judges. Judge Larsen, the floor is yours. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, and thank you very much for inviting me to, uh, to speak to you. Uh, uh, it is a great honor, of course. Uh, the, I said yes immediately, and the order was to uh, independence of judges, Scandinavian countries, in 10 minutes. So that is actually what I'm going to do. Uh, yes, uh, three countries, but there are three similar legal systems. And why do you put all these uh, systems together when we start talking? Yes, because we have a common history and we have a common culture. Uh, we are for Norway, for Norway, we are 400 years of union with Denmark and 100 years of union with Sweden. So there is a lot of common culture. But there are also uh, a lot of differences, important differences, uh, particularly between Denmark and Norway and Sweden, because Sweden has adopted a slightly different legal system. Uh, the Sweden, Swedish system is much more like the civil law system in, uh, in, in, in Central Europe, whereas the, uh, the, the Denmark, and in particular Norway, has adopted the, more the Anglo-Saxon way of, of, of doing things, particularly when it comes to, uh, as, uh, as Greg indicated, uh, to appointment and, 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 and career of, of, of judges. Uh, yes, what are you going to say in 10 minutes then? Well, uh, I thought I should just scratch the surface and uh, do some... I had to find a, a, a sort of, of, of starting point and I thought the, starting, the, the appropriate starting point would be the ENCJ project report 2014 to 2015, which gives important information of the status of the independence of, uh, of, of, of judiciaries. First, let us have a look on the general outcome for, uh, for uh, Europe. Uh, what we did is that we, in 2014, developed a set of indicators for the independence, but uh, also for the accountability. Uh, of course, uh, Jeffrey did mention this uh, uh, initially. Independence is nothing natural, but it has to be earned in a way. You have to be accountable to the society. So we, we, we established a set of indicators, both for the independence and for the accountability. And you can see uh, uh, this is the general outcome. The average are the blue lines, uh, and the highest are these uh, green dots above, and the lowest would be, be, be the, the red ones. And it looks, uh, it looks quite good uh, at Europe, uh, in Europe as a whole. Uh, and how is it in Scandinavia? Well, let's first start with Denmark. Uh, and I think it looks very well. We are, Denmark is on top on most uh, indicators, both the subject, well, both the, on, on uh, accountability and on the, uh, on the independence. Sweden, well, they are, uh, they are lower on the, on the scores, but still scoring quite well. 
and eventually Norway. Somewhere in between uh, Denmark and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Sweden. So what do we get out of it? Main conclusions, I would say, for the Scandinavian countries would be that there is a generally high score on most of the indicators. We are above lowest score on all indicators, except where info is not available. Uh, that is uh, for Norway's uh, part, because we are not a member of EU, so we couldn't use the scoreboards. Uh, and there were, we, we don't have any client surveys, so, so it looks very bad on corruption, but it isn't that bad. Um, there is a generally high trust in society in all three countries. Uh, we have relatively low score on organizational autonomy and legal basis for the judiciary. I'll come back to that a bit later. Uh, for Norway, there is uh, relatively informal allocation of cases, which makes us uh, vulnerable on the, in that respect. Uh, the complaint procedure for Sweden also is a weak point. And uh, uh, this human resources point is also a weak point for Norway because our appointment procedures have some weaknesses. Uh, so let us then go on uh, with, uh, with uh, the uh, ENCJ. ENCJ, as uh, Jeffrey Voss indicated initially, did a very important, they filled a very important gap. Uh, there was very little information on, uh, on uh, subjective accountability. And, and ENCJ decided to fill that gap with a survey among judges in Europe to find out what nobody has tried to do before, how are what do judges think about their own independence? So we did that. Uh, it, uh, there is a misprint, uh, 2014, 2015. We had response from 5,878 judges from 22 European countries, which is a good rate generally. The response rates differed among countries, but it's still significant results. Here you can see it. Uh, to the right, Norway have the biggest response rate, uh, but also Sweden, Denmark are in the, in the upper part of, uh, of, of, of on, on the response right, uh, together with Ireland and UK, Scotland. So what came out of it? Uh, th this will have to be brief. There is a, this is a comprehensive uh, investigation and uh, it will take an hour if we went through it. But the, what you, the, the overall picture, is very important. Uh, hold on. Uh, yes, there you see. We asked uh, the, high, the, the professional judges in my country are. This is uh, one of the key questions. And then we have a scale from 1 to 10. Uh, on the, how they rated the, the, uh, the, uh, their own independence, uh, the independence of the judges in, 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 in their country. And you see the average blue, and the total average is a green line. And from Norway, you can see Norway, Sweden on the, on the uh, right hand side, two and three, uh, well above the average. Denmark in the other end, on the very top, uh, which gives an indication how, how Scandinavian judges uh, uh, regard themselves to be in a, in a, uh, in a um, uh, independence, uh, uh, the, the way they look at their own independence. We also did something else. Uh, the Scandinavian country, one of the features with Scandinavian countries is that we decide a lot of, or most, uh, criminal cases by lay judges sitting with professional judges. And we wanted also wanted to know whether the 
lay judge, how the lay judges were behaving. So we did a somewhat more simplified uh, pilot on lay judges in Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. 300 lay judges in Norway, uh, 200 uh, in, in Denmark, and 100 for Sweden. And you see the response rate underneath. We made a simplified, uh, simplified uh, questionnaire. And the results were interesting. As you see, the, uh, most uh, of, the, uh, of the lay judges felt that they were very independent. So the general conclusions on the survey for Scandinavia, I think, could be summarized as follows. The Scandinavian judges regard themselves very independent, nine and 10 on the scale of 10, as you saw in, uh, initially. A vast majority of the judges have not accepted bribes as an inducement to decide cases in a particular way. Hardly any judges felt that they have been under inappropriate pressure to take decisions in a particular way. Nearly all Scandinavian judges feel that their independence is respected by the governments, parliaments, and social media. And interestingly enough, lay judges and professional judges have very similar opinions. Lay judges are more uncertain about their answers than the professional judges but they do not feel less independent than the professional judges. For Norway, we have also been doing uh, uh, some investigation on uh, the public trust in the Norwegian society. Generally, there has been high trust in the in the uh, judiciary, as you can see here, and higher than uh, the uh, government and the parliament, uh, somewhat at the same level as the police. We have been doing that for many years, since 1996, and uh, the trust has been increasing to some extent. Uh, it's leveling out now. I don't know what sort of sign that would be, but uh, that's how it is. So then, why do we have such a high trust in judiciary in Scandinavian countries? I think, basically, it is because we have a transparent judiciary in all Scandinavian countries. And I think the second bullet point is important because the extensive participation of lay judges in criminal cases involve the inhabitants in decision making and it's commonly believed uh, without any of course conclusive evidence that this contributes a lot and then there is a last a long lasting legal tradition which will probably also contribute so it all looks quite good so far but do we have any challenges in Norway Yes, we have. Uh, there is something missing. Anyway, the main challenge for the Scandinavian judiciary would be, particularly for Norway, but and to a lesser extent, Denmark and Sweden, the court's administrations have very little influence on the uh, budget for the judiciary, which is common for many European countries, of course. Uh, the other thing is that we have insufficient formal structures in place, uh, which you could see from, 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 the, from the indicators. Denmark and Norway, we have a court administration led by a board, majority judges in Denmark and not majority in Norway, uh, not appointed by the peers in any of these countries. Uh, Sweden, they don't have a council, they only have a directorate led by a general director. Uh, but it's a problem that the judiciary uh, 
is not very interested in uh, how the judiciary is organized. Uh, the Association of Judges has for many years tried to, to push uh, for, 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 a better, uh, for better organizational uh, systems, but so far there has been no interest. Combined with a perception of a well-functioning and efficient judicial system, uh, judiciary has, in effect, a very weak position when it comes to negotiation. But I would say that uh, there is a general understanding uh, among the politicians that uh, of the importance of the independence of judges in Norway. So we have had very little of the conflicts we have heard so much of so far. Uh, and, but of course, like most countries, we need uh, uh, modernization of the, of the judiciary in all three countries, digitalization, video, order, uh, video recording of court hearings, and new court buildings are the key elements for, for Norway and also, I think, for Denmark, uh, Sweden, uh, are reporting uh, worries regarding the recruitment of judges and uh, the possible quality problem that could come out of that uh, in a longer perspective. And of course for all three countries security issues are uh, crucial uh, these days and uh, there is a lot of focus on that. But as a whole I think I could say that uh, in Norway, it's more evolution than revolution, and uh, there are quite calm situations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Wigo. Um, I, I must admit that usually, I'm, although the statistical data is a very useful to, tool, I usually am quite uh, skeptical about it because you might say that when I walk out my dog, each of us has three legs statistically and it doesn't prove anything. But um, although our group was very time disciplined, uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but we've just, according to the program, we've just finished lunch and started uh, another discussion panel. But uh, at least I will try to give the floor to the audience and start the discussion. There are four people with microphones all over uh, the room, so if someone wants to ask questions, it's enough to raise your hands. Of course, the questions may be posed in Polish. Um, maybe I'll, I'll take the privilege of being a moderator and I will ask uh, the first question because I was really impressed by what I've heard from uh, uh, Orlando about the importance of truth in our judicial work. And um, if, if you follow the truth, you have a clean conscience that's, uh, that's obvious. And as someone said, the clean conscience is the best pillow for us. Um, although uh, I've, I remember that we have a writer, Stanisław Jerzyletz, and once he said about a judge, I believe that his conscience was clean because he has never used it. I hope no one will ever say that about us. But um, my question would be about the uh, possibility, is there any, uh, of checking the candidates for the judicial position. Can we, I mean, do you have any experience uh, uh, on, in the European field? Can we check their independence before they start being judges? Because that's different in UK, that's different in Scandinavian countries, because first you work as a lawyer. Now in continental countries, that's the question. How can you check that? It's a very difficult question uh, because, because in, in Portugal we have, um, of course, like in the other countries, five years in uh, a school, uh, in the faculty of, of law, and we have a training school, three years, three years in a training school. Uh, before 
to arrive to this training school, they must pass in uh, an exam, uh, a complicated exam, because ex uh, it is an exam to exclude, uh, to put out. Uh, last year, uh, we have um, 100, uh, 120 posts to public prosecutors and judges, and the candidates are 5,000. Then you can imagine what exclusion we must do. After that, we have the training. Of course, in the training is, is difficult, is difficult because the auditors, like we call the auditors of justice, they are very preoccupied to pass, the, 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 to grow up in the phases. And sometimes they cash <laughs> also his opinions. Um, but, but the school have a program of uh, culture of the independence, the culture of the independence. What the culture of the independence means? Uh, the culture of the independence, it's done by the ethics, by the, the, the ethics of the, the judge, by the, the relationships the judge with the other pro legal professions, the relationships the judges with the civil servants of the court, the relationships with the other powers of the state, this makes part of the training before become judge. Of course, it's not enough. It's not enough. Uh, don't give uh, all answers. After that, um, uh, it's the High Council who takes care about the, the, the independence. Uh, we have, we have uh, this... Um, think it's not common in the, in the other countries. Uh, we don't have hierarchy. We don't have hierarchy. Uh, our presidents of court, uh, the, the courts of appeal and Supreme Court, are elected by the judges of the court. And the presidents of the first level and the presidents of the courts of appeal they cannot decide it about the job of the other judges. They have the management of the court, of course, the budget of the court, they must give, but they cannot say this case is for you or this case is for that, or I remove you from this case and I remove, I put that. No, they cannot do this. They cannot give informations to the High Council about the behavior of the judge. Of course, if, if the, the behavior is very, very bad, the president can call on it. But it's not uh, regular uh, the, the activity of the president of the court in this case. That uh, creates a, a culture of the independence uh, very strong. It's not uh, after the dictatorship, before, before. The, this culture of the independence exists. Then, uh, but uh, I, your question, I don't answer it directly, but. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions from the audience? I guess everyone is hungry, so uh, I would like to thank all the speakers, thank the interpreters, and invite you for the lunch. Thank you very much.